He's done it! Uh, how about that for heroics? And up comes Castellanos. He lays out and makes the catch. Kyle Strober tees off. Fastball. Hits him up. It is long gone. The swing and the slide. It is Bethlehem at the back. Castellanos coming on. Castellanos gets it. And the Phillies have the National League Championship. Hey guys, and welcome to Broad Street to Britain, a UK Phillies podcast. Yes, it's 2023, and we are back with a new podcast with me, Dave Shaw, at UK Phillies, and of course, Alex Carr. Alex, how are you, buddy? I am good, sir. Glad to be back, as always. Very, very excited to... We have a lot to talk about. We have got a lot to talk about. Uh, good Christmas, good New Year, although it feels like ages ago now. <laughs> Mine was great. Uh, everything, everything was really good. We did a combined Christmas. Uh, my partner and I, we did, we did a combined family Christmas, um, which was a lot, but also a lot of fun. Um, lots of animals running around, lots of, you know, people running around, but I really got infected with the Christmas spirit. And that was really nice, even though I'm Jewish. Um, <laughs> I still get to, I still get to celebrate a little bit. So, Absolutely. Um, how about you? It was good. Yeah, different, different this year, last year, this year, last year already, uh, but it was good. And then uh, New Year, didn't really do anything because I had a flight the next day, straight out, uh, straight out to Philly on New Year's Day, celebrating the New Year in style, right? What better Amazing. way than to, than to be in Philly for New Year? Uh, first of all, guys, if you're listening or new to the podcast or a returning listener, welcome. We are going to try and get these podcasts a lot more free-flowing this year. Yeah. Um, Last year, yeah, a bit, a bit intermittent. I had a lot going on in life, so uh, it was tough to get the podcast going, but we're good. We're all in a good place, and uh, there's a lot been happening, and we're going to start doing them as well, As you, if you're watching on YouTube. Hi! Hello! <laughs> so we're going to start doing this as well, uh, and start getting a lot more content out there this year, starting with uh, this little pod in January. So, um, yeah, I had my trip. Absolutely amazing. Philly, as ever, you are beautiful, even <laughs> even in the uh, darkest depths of January. Um, but I've always wanted to go over because people say to me, even here, oh, like, what else is there to do in Philly other than uh, baseball and, and all the sports? So I'm like, eh, I don't actually really know. And all I've ever been able to say is, oh, I've heard here is good. And all I've heard here is good. But I've never been actually able to say, oh, I'll definitely try out this. Oh, I've been here and you'll love this. Um, so, you know, I thought this is the perfect opportunity, January, the flights are cheap, um, to get out and see a bit of Philly and a bit of PA and a bit of the area. And it's, uh, I could, I've now been able to come back after an action packed week and say, definitely, you know, if you want something in the mountains and the lakes, the Poconos, stunning, absolutely stunning. Um, wish I had more time there. Uh, if you want something completely out of this world and different to anything, certainly back here, uh, Lancaster County. Like just a completely different and such a cool way of life. Just seeing horse and carts and uh, the amazing little towns and villages, uh, their amazing stores, the food. Oh, definitely the food, the woodcraft. Uh, just uh, just getting out there in general and seeing it all was just amazing. And of course, I need to get this right. The shore, not the coast. <laughs> getting out to the shore, not the beach, because I understand that's a Delaware thing. So the shore, the Jersey shore, uh, that was awesome. Like the boardwalk, it was a lovely day. I lucked out with the weather. It was mild. It was mainly sunny. But one day of rain, if I can remember. And the Saturday I went to Ocean City. It was beautiful winter's day. Um, half the things weren't open, but it was nice. It was quiet. The broad, uh, boardwalk was awesome. Uh, maybe had about an hour in the arcade. Uh, living out my uh, living out my childhood. Um uh, pizza, come on! The hype is real. The pizza was incredible. The food all week was incredible, even in Philly and everywhere I went. Um, I didn't have one cheesesteak this time. Not one cheesesteak. What? No. I know. I always go and I always have the cheese steaks and the fast food stuff. And I thought, no, this time, doing it proper. Because all wow. I've ever, I've heard that Philly is such a, a sports passion town and a food. Food is big in Philly. So I've got right. I'm gonna try out these different restaurants um you know park uh in rittenhouse square is my favorite without a doubt french restaurant absolutely amazing beautiful beautiful area um you know everywhere i ate was was just fantastic great food discovering new drink uh yards 
that's some good stuff. Uh, Yingling, of course. And it was just, it was a great experience. Fantastic. Even in January, loved it, loved it. I've got so much to come back with to tell people. Like a travel guy, you know, a travel a travel bureau I am now for Philadelphia in uh, the surrounding <laughs> area. You know, Paoli, Valley Forge, Bryn Mawr, um, Westchester, New, uh, Newtown Square, uh, Wayne, Media. So many great little spots. Loved it. Can't wait to be back in April. Um, uh, oh, yeah, what a what an experience. What a trip. And all the recommendations that you guys were sending as well on social media. Tried to get as much in as possible. Fantastic recommendations. Can't appreciate it enough. Um, but in the meantime, Alex, and even while <laughs> I was over there, the fills have been have been really busy. Where where do we even start? Should we start with the latest and work our way back? I think that's gonna be yeah, that sounds the good. best way to do this. So first of all, I'm on that Saturday. Two players who I love. I've I've gone along with along with Donnie Sands in in Matt Veeling and Nikki sorry Donnie, uh, yeah, yeah, sorry, Donnie. <laughs> Donnie and his memorable moments um for uh for, for Gregory Soto uh and and uh Clements what do you reckon Alex at first I was like no mates aren't Veeling no two players that I love and then when you break it down and I thought about it you're like okay it's two bench players. Nicky mate, uh, you know, you grow, I grow, fond, uh, you know me, I grow fond of these players, you know, they're like, like my babies. Um, but it's, I think we've got the better of that trade. Yeah, I'm inclined to agree. I mean, like, I tweeted about this a little bit just because like, there are, there's a lot of layers with this trade, right? Mm. Like, obviously, this affects the clubhouse chemistry, this affects, you know, the, the overall feel of the team. Um, a lot of these guys kind of came up through the system with with Maton and with Veerling. Um, specifically, I mean, like guys like Alec Bohm, uh, guys like especially Bryson Stott. I mean, they Bank have a whole kids. little yeah, they have a whole little friend group, you know. Yeah. But um, it's it's hard to be objectively baseball about this particular trade because, like, obviously, there's a human factor to these things. These guys are really good, you know. They're great guys, loved in the clubhouse, but. The Phillies ultimately turned what were three roster bubbles, if you will. I mean, I I was shocked through the postseason. They had four catchers on their 40-man roster. It Donnie Sands, Raphael Marchand, and then, of course, JT and Garrett Stubbs. Yeah. But it was really interesting to see, you know, they, they exchanged 40-man depth pieces for a legitimate unicorn arm, as it were, right? Like, Gregory Soto is, is the hardest throwing pitcher, left-handed pitcher in baseball. Period. End of story. Like yeah, yeah. average velocity, he's got it. Like he he is the hardest throwing left-handed pitcher in the game. And that is not something you find very often. I don't know if there are any people out there that remember when Aroldis Chapman came up, a lefty throwing, let alone 105, but like a lefty throwing the way that he threw was was absolutely unheard of. So this is a very rare, rare thing to have. Um, and regardless of whether or not he succeeds, you know, that's talent worth taking a bet on. Right. So absolutely. Yeah. Oh, yeah. In the end, you've dealt depth for an all star caliber closer, um, maybe closer. Who knows? Um, and then, you know, a depth piece as well in Cody Clemens, who, you know, I don't really see the um, inherent value, but I know he's got some raw power and I know they've they've probably got some adjustments lined up. Um, but ultimately, you can kind of guess that that kind of player is is not just like a, a, a throw in per se, yeah. because he's going to be on the 40 man roster. So they're, they're not just acquiring him for, for no reason or for like to make up a little bit of extra value. They see something in Cody Clemens that they're probably going to try and turn him into a legitimate bench piece. So, um, and you know, it doesn't hurt to acquire a guy with lineage, right. Being Roger Clemens son. So, um, yeah, yeah, you know, yeah. I, in, in the end, I loved the deal. Um, I think that, you know, it's obviously sad to see those guys go, but they weren't going to be starting players here in, in Philadelphia and, and, that's what smart teams do. You deal from your depth. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, I, I trust Dave Dombrowski. <laughs> you know, what he's already done for this organization has been unreal. Uh, Soto, uh, 3.28 ERA last year. Uh, interestingly, has 30 saves last year in 33 attempts. Has six, In his career, has 60 saves in 64 attempts. That's a good ratio. That's a That's way more... Uh, accurate than I would have expected with a guy like Soto, who is 
not necessarily the greatest uh, command rated pitcher in, in all of baseball. No, I, and <laughs> you know, if you think about it, what we just had David Robertson and now, you know, going from him to a potential closing Robertson to Soto, that's a big upgrade. That's a, that's yeah. a really big upgrade right there. It also is. I mean, it, it's worth noting when you look forward to the left-handed pitcher free agent classes of, you know, 2023 and onward, um, things start to get a little slim uh, in terms of pickings. Uh, Josh Hader is a free agent next year. I'm not so sure he'll hit the free agent market, but again, he's going to come with a qualifying offer, right? The Padres are going to offer him a qualifying offer. Whether or not he accepts, who knows? But then the drop-off is like pretty steep. It's Jose Alvarado, which is, you know, if he repeats this year, he's due for a big payday. Oh yeah. Maybe the Phillies pay him, maybe not. I don't know. Um, But then it's like, Wandy Peralta and then like Aaron loop. And then from there, it's <laughs> just constant decline. So, I mean, you look at the foresight from Dave Dombrowski here, if they lose Jose Alvarado, they have, you know, it's kind of a meme, but like they have Jose Alvarado at home, right? They have Gregory Soto, who is, who is yep. just, you know, pretty much the same kind of pitcher. And they're probably going to take a similar development path with him. So, um, you know, it's a it's a really, really nice move in terms of foresight um, and just in terms of, you know, in general, you can't have too many high stuff left handed pitchers in your bullpen. You, you not, want that. Not only that, if you look what we've already done to the likes of Alvarado, to even Connor Brogdon, who got better as the year went on, two players who went down, of course, in season yeah. and came back up. Uh, see what they've done to, to Suarez. You know, they reformed him a little bit from his sluggish start. They're getting some magic stuff out of Wheeler. Uh, you know, uh, the pitching staff, you know, once they get hold of Soto, that could be that could be exciting. That could be really, really exciting. Well, and you look at what other pitchers have said to what Craig Kimbrell said. I think it was Matt Gelb of The Athletic uh, put out a piece uh, that was detailing kind of what Kimbrell had said uh, during his press conference or his Zoom, his Zoom conference. Um, he talks about, you know, their, their, their approach biomechanically as well as their approach in terms of game planning. Um, and you really kind of start to piece together a little bit how what they're really doing is they're targeting stuff first. Like what they what they said last year, right? They were like, we're going all in on a stuff-based bullpen. And it worked. Their bullpen was fantastic. So what they're what they're doing is they're targeting guys that may have, you know, a little less good control, making some biomechanical adjustments specifically in delivery um, and refining pitch mixes a little bit. And then just telling them to throw strikes because their natural movement is yep. just going to, is just going to work for them. And look at what, when Alvarado stopped trying to bite the zone and just started throwing fastballs like over the plate and then cutters down and in, it was over. It yeah. was over yeah. for everybody. Nobody could hit him. So, I mean, why not just keep going? Keep, keep trying that same strategy. It's working. Um, and, and they certainly have targeted that same profile in many other guys uh, that followed not only Gregory Soto, but, you know, many, many other pitchers that they've seemingly brought in this year uh, to make similar adjustments. Yeah, well, there's there's Mar recently Marte from San Francisco. Mm -hmm. uh, ERA, not so impressive. I think it was 5.44 ERA last year. But what, what are the field getting uh, in, in Marte? Well, with Junior Marte, you also, I mean, his expected stats last year, because it's it's really rare that you kind of get a really solid sample size from these guys, these like fringe 40-man uh, players. Um, it, it's pretty rare that you that you get somebody who has a substantial enough sample size to really dig into their expected stats, but yeah. his expected stats were really good. Uh, a big, big departure from his, uh, from his, you know, base level on paper stats. It looked like his slider was getting really unluckily hit hard. Um, it had like an expected batting average of something like 222. And then it was getting slugged for like five something when the expected slug was like in the threes. Um, so, you know, obviously got a little unlucky, but again, another guy with some control issues, but really, really great stuff. I would imagine he's probably going to be that kind of guy that you see them add a little bit more, of a signature movement path to the slider, um, whether that is like a sweeping path or maybe it, it just dips uh, in like a 12 to six motion, who knows. Um, but I think that, you know, he's, he's probably going to be a guy that they look at as a bat breaker, throw a lot of fill up the zone with, you know, high octane strikes, break yeah. some bats, get some weak contact. Cause that's what he was good at with the giants. And I mean, to, 
to lose Eric Miller in that trade, you kind of have to, there, there's a lot that I feel like we don't know uh, about, about even, even, you know, some of us that are a little more plugged in. Um, there is a lot of surprising roster minutia going on this off season. The there trade is, of Eric yeah, Miller, yeah. the the DFA of Francisco Morales. I mean, there's got to be some stuff that 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 we don't really we don't really know because Eric Miller obviously struggled with injuries and had some command troubles. But I mean, he was definitely going to be in my top twenty prospects in the system this year. Um, and and same with Francisco Morales. You know, so you have to wonder what maybe information we're missing there. Um, and we also don't know the future of Morales yet, which is odd. So yeah, you know. Yeah. It's it's an interesting an interesting is, uh, year, but is, is Marte someone who we think will go straight into the uh, bigs, or do you think a, a stint in the minors first? Yeah. So what the way that the Phillies bullpen is stretching out right now, the way that things look, you've got a back end tandem of Soto, Kimbrel, uh, Dominguez, and Alvarado, with then a middle innings tandem of Bellotti, Brogdon, and Strom. And then that eighth spot, which is nearly guaranteed to be a bullpen spot. Now, I thought that maybe there was a chance that. Uh, Andrew Painter would kind of maybe get a shot to make the bigs. I don't think yep. that's happening now with the acquisition of Soto because in that eighth spot, they're going to want to churn guys through. So you've got the, um, oh my goodness, you've got Nick Nelson. You've got guys like uh, Yelman, who they acquired from the Cubs. You've got guys like Marte. You've got guys like... Um, Plasmeyer. There's Oh, Plasmeyer. Yeah, Michael yep. Plasmeyer. So like guys that can just continuously Baker. kind of... Yeah, even Drew Baker. Drew Baker's probably going to take a little bit longer. He's probably going to get some reps at AAA. Even Griff McGarry. I mean, like, who yeah, knows yeah. what happens with that eighth spot, but they are definitely going to churn guys through. Um, and the reason I don't bring up guys like Sam Coonrod uh, or, or somebody like that is because they only have a singular uh, minor league option left. So those are guys that they're probably going to be pretty careful with when it comes to calling them up. Um, if anything, Coonrod might be like the first guy that they call up. And then if he stumbles a little bit they send him down to the minors and that's his last you know minor league option burned right there so um we'll see what happens it's isn't, gonna be it's gonna be interesting isn't it amazing that two years ago we had to work open in sam MLB, Kunrad in was the their most MLB. reliable reliever two years ago like what and now we have this bullpen when you, when you were naming off the names there it's like this bullpen is is good and it's deep yeah. Dave you know, Dombrowski has done an incredible job. What an incredible a job. job. And, and you know, some of these names, that even when they were brought in, we were like, eh, I don't know. But again, the, the, the coaching has been phenomenal. Like you said, like yep. Soto, Big Kimball, Dominguez, Alvarado. Yeah. Whoa. <laughs> you no, know, that is good. If you told that to a Phillies fan in 2020 after they had just watched Brandon Workman <laughs> blow oh, a, a six-run lead. Oh. Oh, or, or David Hale coming to face Trevor Story. If you had told if you had told the Phillies fan, hey, don't worry, you're gonna have a back end tandem of Sir Anthony Dominguez, Jose Alvarado, Gregory Soto, and Craig Kimbrell, they would have slapped you across the face. I, there was even, there's no way, you know. And and Kimbrell got a lot of you know very mixed when he came in. But I was looking at his 2022 stats, 3.75 ERA, not bad. Uh, wasn't bad at all for the Dodgers. Twenty-two saves in twenty-seven attempts. Uh, um, but again, do, do you think? Uh, do you think Tom uh, Thompson will go by closer by committee to start off with? Definitely, I think that. I think they're playing their cards a little closer to the vest than it's going to actually be during the season. I think my initial thought was. Sir Anthony and Alvarado were going to get like the seventh and eighth innings, depending yeah. on the lineup orientation, um, because that just. To me, that makes a lot of sense. Those guys are locked down, but you don't necessarily need to stress them out with closing duties. Um, with Soto, I think that he is another guy that like in high stress innings, he can handle it. Maybe not a closer, uh, but definitely high stress kind of guy. Maybe he'll show himself as a closer. But with Kimbrell, Kimbrell has a reputation for, for struggling outside of safe scenarios. So I thought that maybe he would be the guy that they go to more often than not. I guess that's not the plan, but I think eventually a closer is going to establish themselves. Um, and and I think that that is going to happen, uh, you know, probably a few months into the season. But I think there's good, there's just going to be one guy that probably runs away with it and they trust more than the others. And, who who you do know. you, if you had to make a call now, who would you see that being? Sir Anthony possibly or? I honestly think because if Craig Kimbrell is coming to Philadelphia, 
and willing to make changes to his tried and true arsenal, he could really be good. He has that like mentality of a closer yeah. um, that that you really need. Obviously, I mean, he's the active saves leader, for goodness sake. Like, there's a reason that he is who he is and he's established the reput- reputation that he has. So if he's really willing to make some tweaks to his arsenal and his pitch usage, I think there could really be a strong case for Craig Kimbrell to be that go-to closer kind of guy. If not, probably Soto. I'd say probably Greg Soto because he has the most experience um, in that role. So we'll see. I mean, it's going to be fun to watch either way. And and Brad Hand could be on on call again for some more saves. (laughs) Uh, uh, we'll see where he ends up. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, well, it, and it's just quickly on the uh, bullpen. Uh, Matt Stram from the Red Sox also came in. Uh, actually, had a, not a bad year last year for the Red Sox. Well, his. That's like for me, the additions of Kimbrel and Soto only made the Strom acquisition better because mm. I think Strom is probably the guy they're going to turn to for multiple innings now. I think he's that kind of guy that. Um, because you know he's been a starter for the majority of his career injuries obviously derailed him a little bit but then he came back with the Red Sox out of the bullpen and was kind of a not a mop-up guy per se but he pitched multiple innings when he came in for relief a majority of the time I think Um, so you know this is a guy that you know even though they have now three left-handed pitchers in the in the bullpen kind of de facto um, this is a guy that definitely can provide you more than one inning um, and is someone who has a lot more upside than he might let on. Um, He's struggled to stay healthy, but I mean, he's got some really, really good pitch identities that, and, and, and characteristics that are really exciting in a guy like him. So uh, especially from the left side. So I'm looking forward to that. I think he's going to be one of the more underrated acquisitions by the Phillies this year. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I'm, I'm getting excited already. <laughs> Me too. <laughs> just, talking about, just talking about this bullpen. Uh, is going to be excited already, but it, it, we're in a great place. We're in a great place with the bullpen, yeah. you know. And Connor Brogdon can probably do some middle innings as well. What a oh great, yeah, you know what a what a great what a great depth, what great Dave, bullpen. I can't believe we're saying this. Where would um, you rank their bullpen among the NL East? I'm curious to know. Oh, that's tough though. <laughs> um, it's potential. It's potential to be up there with the best. Surely, let's be honest here. You know, it's I'm not just we're saying with my red and white uh, Phillies goggles on. It has <laughs> the, the potential there is to be quite shut down as it was yeah. last year, and we've added to it. You know, and what what I loved about Topper last year and how refreshing it was after watching Girardi is that he put the closes, he put the, the pitches in by feel of the game. How refreshing, you know, and sometimes it looked odd, you know, eight inning, Sir Anthony will come in and Brad Ham will do the ninth, but he went by lineup and he went by the strengths of, you know, oh, hang on, back end of the lineup in the ninth, Brad Ham's got this, we'll get Alvarado and Dominguez in the meet the lineup in the seventh and eighth innings. Uh, he had so much trust in that bullpen and nine times out of 10, they came out, they, they, came, they came through, you know, okay, postseason, I think they were tiring, you know, the, the bullpen was empty, everybody was empty, let's be honest, um, they'd given it everything, and you, you know, you couldn't fault them, because they had given everything throughout the postseason, they had nothing left, and that's all you can ask from, from your pitchers and from your team. Um, going into bullpen to rotation, I presume now, I think it's safe to say Bailey Fulton will stay in the rotation, do you think he won't, he won't drop back now? I don't think so. I think he's probably got, unless, you know, barring some sort of, uh, I guess, minor league competition deal uh, or or, or something of that nature. I think he's probably got it, Um, which I I love that idea. I think that that is that is a great way to to test and see what you've got. I mean, he's the fifth starter, so you're not exactly looking for, you know, you're just looking for a guy that can give you five innings, six innings, maybe, uh, you know give up three to four runs every start and you're, you're pretty good. So, you know, you're keeping your team in the game at least. Um, but he really, I mean, he surprised a lot of people last year. Um, and even though the, the expected stats don't look insanely great, I think that the more confidence he gains, again, I, I say this every year, if he can find that little velocity bump that he had back in 2020 before he, uh, he got COVID and, and then that kind of derailed him a little bit. But um, if he can find that little velocity bump, he will be really, really effective. And worst case, he he bumps into the bullpen and you you kind of bring somebody else up. But um, yeah, I think I think he probably has the the fifth rotation spot. Yeah, and of course you've got well, Syndergaard's gone. Eflin 
has gone and all the best to, to both Everyone of those. Syndergaard prepare came in. for Zach Eflin. Zach Eflin is going to be great in Tampa Bay. If he can stay healthy, obviously, but he's going to be great. Yeah, I'm quite relieved he's out the NL. I know we'll still see every team next year, and we will see him at, probably at some point, but I'm quite glad he's, he's out the NL East. We're not going to see him as much because uh, really good. Just, you just know if one of those pitchers is going to come back to Citizens Bank and just haunt us. So I'm quite glad that... Uh, but all the best to Zach Eflin. What a what a guy in general, you know. And I, I, you know, on his day when Zach was on it, he was again, it was a great picture to watch. Did a great yes. job for Syndergaard. Came in, did did a job, you know, for his short term contract. Um, we're gonna have Tyson Walker. So we've got Wheeler, Walker, Nola, Suarez, Falter. Would you want to see one more come in, or do you think that's the five, and then possibly? Painter maybe as a six, or do you think Painter will now get more reps in the minors before we see him? They are definitely going to be very careful with all of Painter, Abel, and McGarry. I think that those are guys that they are looking at and saying for a postseason run, depending on how they, you know, how their minor league campaigns are going and depending on how uh, taxed their arms are. And I think they're going to take that into account. But for a postseason run, having three fresh arms that you can call on and just say, hey, here we go. Yeah, that's a pretty big deal. Um, so I, I I think Painter Painter obviously it's been said that he has the best chance of making the the opening day roster. I don't I think that's pretty much out of the cards now, um, unless he has some ridiculously amazing spring. Um, but mm-hmm. I don't think it's out of the question that by mid season he could be up and maybe usurp that that fifth starter spot. As far as everything else goes, I mean. I'm psyched for that rotation. That rotation is very, very good. That tandem of Wheeler and Nola at the top obviously led them to the World Series uh, this year and, and maybe came up a little short, but they were, they were tired, guys. Come on. Um, yeah, yeah. But then, you know, Ranger being Ranger and, and having a little bit more time this year to prepare. Obviously, last year with the visa issues, um, that got him off on the wrong foot. Same with Wheeler and his injury. Um, so, you know, very excited for both of those guys to have a full offseason to prepare. Well, as full as it can be when you are returning from the yeah. World Series. Yeah, um, yeah. But, you know, and then Taiwan Walker, I'm excited to see how that develops. 3.44 ERA last year in 152 innings is, is- Good, solid. You can solid. sell me on any starting pitcher that throws a splitter. You can sell me <laughs> anytime because they're all good, all of them, yep. especially when their splitter is as good as Taiwan Walker's. You look at Kevin Gaussman. You look at Alex Cobb and the step forward he took last year before he got hurt. You look at all these guys that 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 throw splitters as a reliable secondary. Almost all those starters succeed if they can command it. So I'm not trying to impose any, you know, uh unrealistic expectations on Taiwan but I mean boy is it going to be really fun to watch his stuff develop and see what the Phillies do with him and it's also from a human perspective again it's great to see some diversity in the cast of characters that we have uh in with the Phillies this year because boy it was getting a little bit monochromatic (laughs) yeah Yeah. and And that was worrisome (laughs) and I'll tell you what saying how how does our bullpen stack up to the rest of the NL East but there are our rotation you know, again, could be, you know, I'm getting excited, it's a about, good our, one. I can get excited about our pitching. I can't believe two years, three years ago, you, I would even be like this about our pitching. But again, this rotation could be just, if they show the form of the back end of last season and, and you know, that run from June, it could be, it could be mighty. Obviously we're going to have bad days. You know, you're going to have some bad starts here and there. That's baseball. Every pitcher goes for it. Um, Another refreshing thing is that remember two years ago when we used to, had no depth, all these injuries, and we were pushing up, you know, these prospects quickly through the ranks, had no time to season themselves in the minors. You know, Spencer Howard, I think, is a prime example. You know, we <laughs> rushed him up straight to the bigs, and now, I don't even know, he's still at the Rangers? Where Where is Spencer He Howard is still now? with the Rangers. You know, it's nice that we can now take our time a little bit on Abel and, uh, and Painter and sort of let him season a bit in the minors a bit more, get him really ready, get him dialed in and then bring him up. You know, it's nice to have that depth to look after our prospects as well and bring them up when they're ready, not because we've got nobody else, you know? Right. Um, so the, the bullpen, the rotation, do you think, do you see, who would you like to see else come in on that side of things? It, it's uh, oh, man. one more, one more bullpen piece, one more rotation piece. What can you see the Phil's doing? Honestly, bullpen wise, they're they're pretty set. Um, they 
they have done a lot to bolster that depth, not only internally, but just in terms of, you know, who they've gone out and acquired. Um, John Duplantier was signed to a minor league deal a, 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 like a week or so ago. Um, he's a really interesting arm to look at. He's never really had a full season to work on like in a relief capacity, but was once, a, a, a I think, the top prospect in the Diamondbacks organization as a starting pitcher. So, you know, very interesting arm there could really benefit from, you know, learning the Philly cutter as it were. Mm. Um, so that will be an interesting one to watch as far as rotation, maybe, a you know, sign a couple of guys that are going to eat you some innings in the minors. And, and, and maybe if you, if you need them, um, you call them up. I mean, Plasmeyer is as good as seven eighth starting pitcher as, as you can find right now. Um, he's got a bunch of minor league options left. So, I mean, in terms of depth, I feel like they'll they'll just answer any issues internally. You know, you can call on Painter, you can call on Abel, you can call on McGarry, you can call on Bailey Falter if he ends up getting sent back down. If they want to acquire a starting pitcher at the deadline, they have a rotation piece with minor league options in Bailey Falter. Um, yeah, yep, you know, yep. it's completely and fully up to them uh, where they feel they need to go. But honestly, for the first time, I can say on a pitching side of things, I think I'm fully satisfied with I think we're set, where right? they are. Yeah. It's uh, it's kind of shocking. <laughs> yeah, it is. Yeah, no, when you think about it, it really is. And then it's nice to go into a season, you know, into spring with already a rotation set. Right, here you go, yeah. guys. This is going to be your days, bullpen. Yeah, no battles, no, no exactly. issues. Exactly, yeah, yeah. 